best analogy to understand what is a cell, consider looking at a building. A building is composed of walls. What is the basic building block of that wall? It is a single brick, of course. Like a brick wall, your body is composed of basic building blocks, and the building blocks of your body are cells. A cell is the smallest unit of a living thing. All living things, including yourself, is considered as an organism. Thus, cells are the basic building blocks of all organisms. In multicellular organisms, several cells of one particular kind interconnect with each other and perform numerous shared functions to form tissues. A cell, however, has a surface to volume ratio, and as cells grow, they increase in number but have limitation on its size. Before discussing the criteria for determining whether a cell is prokaryot or eukaryot, let us examine how biologists study cells. Cells vary in size. With few exceptions, individual cells are too small to be seen with the naked eye. So the scientists use microscopes to study them. A microscope is an instrument that magnifies an object. Most images of cells are taken with a microscope and are called micrographs. Light microscopes commonly used in the undergraduate college laboratory magnify up to approximately 400 times. Parameters used are magnification controlled by the objectives and resolving power, which is the ability to look for clarity. Such is also used in cameras. Light enters through the specimen, which is placed on the stage. The eyepiece is used to observe the specimen. The specimen is required to be very thin to allow the light source to pass through it. Structures within cells are usually colorless. Hence, different stains are used to distinguish the structures. A second type of microscope used in laboratories is the dissecting, or also called as a scanning microscope. These microscopes have a lower magnification, 20 to 80 times the object size, than light microscope. They can provide a three-dimensional view of the specimen. Thick objects can be examined with many components in focus at the same time. These microscopes are designed to give the magnifica magnification and clarity of tissue structure as well as the anatomy of the whole organ. In contrast to light microscope, electron microscopes use a beam of electrons in instead of a beam of light. Not only does this allow for higher magnification and thus for more detail, it also provides higher resolving power. They use electrons to pass through the specimen and which are cut even thinner and finer. The electrons can pass through sections in a transmission electron microscope, TEM, or through whole specimens such as shown on right via a confocal microscope. The image of the larval brains were taken by me during my graduate research. The microscopes we use today are far more complex than those used in the 1600s by Antony van Leeuwenhoek, a Dutch shot keeper who had great skill in crafting lenses. Later in 1665, Robert Hooke observed cells from a tea bark through a lens. Since they look like box rooms, he called them cells. Later, in 1670, Leeuwenhoek discovered live cells in his own feces. In early 1800s, a uh, British biologist stated the three main components of a cell. 
All organisms consist of one or more cells, the smallest unit that retains the capacity for life. Secondly, all cells arise from the growth and division of another cell. You can see from the image here a comparative logarithmic scale comparison of the size of the cell and its visibility seen via naked eye, light, and electron microscope. Simplest pictorial cells to the ostrich eggs, all cells share four common components a plasma membrane, an outer covering that separate the cell's interior from its surrounding environment. Number two, cytoplasm consisting of a jelly-like region within the cell in which other cellular components are found. Thirdly, DNA, the genetic material of the cell. And fourth, ribosome particles that synthesize proteins. However, prokaryotes differ from eukaryote cells in several ways. Small size of prokaryotes allows ions and organic molecules that enter them quickly to spread to other parts of the cell. Similarly, any waste products produced within a prokaryotic cell can quickly move out. However, larger eukaryotic cells have evolved different structural adaptations to enhance cellular transport. What is a prokaryotic cell? It's a cell that is simple, single-celled unicellular organism that lacks a nucleus or any other membranes-bound organelles. We will shortly come to see that it's significantly different than eukaryotic. Prokaryotic DNA is found in the central part of the cell, a darkened region called as the nucleoid. Like archaea and eukaryotes, bacteria have cell wall made up of peptoglycan that is comprised of sugars and amino acids, and many have a polysaccharide additional capsule. The cell wall acts as an extra layer of protection, helps the cell maintain its shape, and prevents dehydration. The capsule enables the cell to attach to surfaces in its environment. Some prokaryotes have flagella, hyli, or fimbriae. Flagella are used for locomotion, while most pili are used to exchange genetic material during a type of reproduction called conjugation. On the other hand, a eukaryotic cell is a cell that has a membrane-bound nucleus and other membrane-bound components or sacs called organelles, which have specialized functions. The word eukaryotic means true kernel or true nucleus, alluding to the presence of, a, of the membrane-bound nucleus in these. The word organelle means little organ, and as already mentioned, Organelles have specialized cellular function, just as the organs of your body have specialized. Eukaryotes have a more complex structure than prokaryotic cells. Organelles allow for various functions to occur in the cell at the same time. Before discussing the functions of organelles within a eukaryotic cell, let us first examine two important components of the cell the plasma membrane, and the cytoplasm. Common in cells are components such as plasma membrane, a region where all cellular functions are controlled, called as nucleus in one cell type, eukaryotes, and another cell type called as a nucleoid region. And thirdly, all cells have a fluid component where other structures, namely ribosomes, are found in the cytoplasm. Phospholipid drifts within the bilayer in a dynamic manner. If you've ever seen soap bubbles floating on the surface of the water, this is how the dynamic nature of the phospholipid bilayer with embedded proteins, sterols, and other components appear. The plasma membrane regulates the passage of sub some substances. 
such as organic molecules, ions, and water, preventing the passage of some to maintain internal condition while actively bringing in or removing others. Other compounds more passively pass across the membrane. Proteins make up the second major chemical component of a plasma membrane. Integral proteins are embedded in the plasma membrane and may span all or part of the membrane. Integral proteins may serve as channels or pumps to move materials in and out of the cells. Peripheral proteins are found on the exterior or interior surface of the membrane. They are either attached to the integral proteins or to phospholipid molecules. Both integral and peripheral proteins may serve as enzymes, as structural attachments for the fibers of the cytoskeleton, or as part of the cell's recognition site. Carbohydrates are the third major component of the plasma membrane. The cytoplasm comprises the component of a cell between the plasma membrane and the nuclear membrane, or the nuclear envelope, a structure to be discussed shortly. Um, it is made up of organelles suspended in the gel-like cytosol, the cytoskeleton, and various chemicals as shown in two uh, images here. Even though the cytoplasm consists of 70 to 80 percent water, it has a semi-solid consistency which comes from the proteins within it. If you were to remove all organelles from a cell, would the plasma membrane and the cytoplasm be the only components left? The answer is no. Cytoplasm, there would still be ions and organic molecules, plus a network of protein fibers that helps to maintain the shape of the cell, secures certain organelles in specific positions, and allows cytoplasm and vesicles to move within the cell, and enables unicellular organisms to move independently. Collectively, this network of protein fiber is known as the cytoskeleton. There are three types of fibers within the cytoskeleton. Microfilaments, also known as the actin filaments, intermediate filaments, and microtubules. Microfilaments are the thinnest of the cytoskeletal uh, fibers and they function in moving cellular components, for example, during cell division. Intermediate filaments are of intermediate diameter and have structural functions such as maintaining the shape of the cell and anchoring the organelles. Microtubules guide organelle movement and are the structures that pull chromosomes to the poles during cell division. Some examples of microtubules are or flagellum. Um, they are long hair-like structures and they extend from the plasma membrane and are used to move an entire cell examples, a sperm cell and a euglena cell. Secondly, cilia, which are many in number, and they extend along the entire surface of the plasma membrane. They are short, hair-like structures that are used to move the entire cell, such as a paramecium. Uh, this concludes our first section of the cell, and we have more lectures to continue with the remaining uh, content of this uh, chapter.